I tell you, even before I say hello, I want to say I just met Mr. Universe, the official Mr. Universe over there. I've got to ask him today. What I've always wanted to ask uh, is the day approaching when women, when women will be as, uh, or even more bulging, or even more muscular than men. And does he, does he, does Mr. Universe, as a uh, professional muscle man, does he prefer the uh, muscular woman or the soft and uh, fluffy type of woman. I think it's gonna be fun to meet Mr. Universe. We're gonna meet the man who specializes in real estate. You see him all over TV. He's very celebrated for his seminars on real estate. His name is Tony Hoffman. We've got the author of a very uh, well-reviewed novel, two authors of The Long Way Home, Alan Ebert and Janice Rothstein of uh, The Long Way Home. And uh, I've got uh, one of the really appreciated and uh, beloved uh, singers with us today, Miss Marlene Verplank, who's actually here on the radio all the time. She's here for a good cause for lupus uh, cure and the battle against uh, a horrible uh, uh, disease. I've got many, many, many surprises, but I want to tell you one thing that... Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Regis Philbin for being so nice to me when I was on his show. Regis told me about a certain guest, of it, and Bill Boggs said to me, Joe, and Margaret Whiting, most of all, Margaret Whiting said to me, Joe, You've got to meet her, uh, you and me, we've got to meet her, uh, her uh, producer, fiancé, and his name is Jack Wrangler. I've always wanted to meet Jack Wrangler. Of course, when I first saw that name, I thought that was a good name for somebody who rides in a rodeo. That's, uh, <laughs> that, uh, it's kind of a 50s name, isn't you, it? Um, you've heard that before, right? Well, what happened, because I was wearing a Wrangler work shirt at right. the time, when um, I was rehearsing a play, and it was a non-union show and i was a member of actors equity and at that time well still now if you if you do a non-union show and you're equity um you get in a lot of trouble they find you a lot of money and i really want to do this play joe so uh the night the program went to print i said well we got to make up a phony name and so i said well why i was wearing this wrangler work show. i said why don't you call me jack wrangler and make up a phony biography so they said that I was from Minnesota and that I wanted to be a forest ranger and that if the play failed, I could always go back to the trees and the name stuck. My guest has got a good name with a good book. It's published by St. Martin's Press. You're going to meet Charlotte Chandler in about a minute. Jack Wrangler has written uh, the Jack Wrangler story or What's a Nice Boy Like You Doing? Before I lose my uh, Margaret White, I happen, to be, I happen to be a great fan. I think she's one of the better singers. How could I not ask you, Jack? In, in your intimate moments, does she ever talk about her... Uh, wonderful father, a man named Richard A. Whiting. She talks about you a really? lot. Uh, yeah. not, not the real truth, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> and not in that intimate moment, but she, <laughs> she's a big fan of yours. Right. Um, I'm a big, she, she's one of the better singers, for sure. Yeah, Richard, uh, well, we, he's one of the great American composers. Um, everything from the good ship lollipop to beyond the blue horizon ain't we got fun to marvelous for words jack to Ray did, for hollywood does she ever talk about an early day tv show with margaret whiting and barbara and jack albertson's sister mabel albertson yes who played her mother right. that was those whiting girls right and uh barbara her daughter uh, her sister was on it and was wonderful and i used to watch it when i was a kid i had a series at the same time and uh, i watched her series i don't know whether she watched mine. Yours was called, you, you won the Emmy for your series. Yes, uh, Faith of Our Children. With and, Eleanor uh, Powell. Eleanor Powell, who you must have met many times. Love her, great, great, and, great uh, dancer. She played my mother in the thing, and the line, the family that prays together, stays together, came from that show. And what was one uh, typical situation, Jack? A typical situation would be like I would walk into a home of a very a wealthy family and by mistake break a vase and then I'd spend the rest of the half hour figuring out how to pay for it. Um, it was a very moral show. Dull, uh, but... Uh, a but little bit before today's openness, right, Jack? I'm afraid so, yes. I don't think we get away with that now. I think today I'd figure out how I was going to lie about it or something. I don't know. How can we not make a very important uh, statement to TV people who love uh, old-time series? Jack Wrangler's father, I believe I heard or read, was the producer of Bonanza. He was the executive producer of Bonanza. Dave Dortort was the producer. How can we not ask, uh, did you hang around the set and did you meet oh, yeah. uh, Dan Blocker and people like that? Yeah, I used to all the time. I'd go over there and, um, you know, the whole Ponderosa was on a soundstage. It was not outdoors or anything. And all the trees that you would see at the 
front of the Ponderosa were all cut off after eye level. And so you walked in, and it was like this tiny little house, and the Ponderosa said, and, and uh, Dan Blocker was wonderful guy. The only thing that they always worried about with him is he loved to race cars, and they mm. didn't like him to race him because he was a, they were afraid he was going to get hurt or something. Died very suddenly, didn't he? Yeah, it's a shame. Did you have any favorite members of that cast besides Dan Blocker, maybe? Dan and Lauren Green, I think, were closest to me. Then. Right. And how'd you happen to break into directing, Mr. Well, um, the first show I directed was with somebody else, you know, Gail Storm. Um, My, My Little Margie. Oh, Susanna. And that was Plaza Suite. And we did it in Texas. And I started directing for chains of dinner theaters. And we would have 12 theaters, and I would do many shows and ship them out on the chain, and they would run. So I might have six or seven shows running at once. Betty Hutton I directed, Devon DiCarlo, uh, uh, Jane Russell, uh, full-figured girls. Jack, uh, they're, they're, they're here to stay, right? Yes, they are. How, how would you define that word, cabaret theater, which I know you're involved in? And has that, has that fizzled out, or, or is it still... Yeah, yeah, well, now I think it's kind of fizzled out. For a long period of time, people loved the idea that you could go into one place, have dinner, see a show, and have a wonderful evening. Uh, then, I guess, uh, if, uh, the last, about the last six years, it's been kind of going down the tubes. And I was very lucky to be in it when it was really flourishing. I started at the Ivanhoe Theater in Chicago as a kid actor and played the juvenile and everything and finally uh, started directing and then was director, of, well, and still am. As a matter of fact, Marlene Verplank, who's on the show tonight, uh, I'm directing her right now for a show she's doing at Freddy's and also I'm directing the, uh, and written the Johnny Mercer show I that Margaret and Marlene and I do. I do a big stroll down memory lane and talk about Johnny Mercer today with Jack Wrangler. Uh -huh. Opposite Jack Wrangler is... You talk about uh, a very astute uh, and creative writer, uh, Jack, and I'm sure you are. I can't wait to go through this. <laughs> Thank you. lady who puts her finger uh, below the surface, on the surface, above the surface. She's got her finger on the pulse, and she writes only bestsellers. A very dear friend of ours named Charlotte Chandler, who brought me King Vidor, and I repeated that show, and sadly, he passed away since that show was taped. But he was, that was one of my... Uh, great days and uh, do you think about King Vidor once he, he directed the big parade and almost everything I think about him all the time he was a great person in my life he's in my new book and this uh, lady wrote the big book on Groucho Marx called uh, called hello I must be going I gotta ask you gotta ask you <laughs> is, is Groucho Marx in the ultimate seduction Charlotte as he maybe? is I, I think he'll always be in my books actually he encouraged me to write not only hello I must be going but also this one too Charlotte and I were talking about that yeah. before the show I went steady with Melinda Marx when really? I was a kid and we did a show together with Buddy Epson called Vaudebeat and then we fell in love I think we were eight years old or something at the time <laughs> Was that, was that one of your uh, early love affairs, or was that sort of later on in life when you were eight years old? <laughs> I think my first love affair was with a girl named Susie Cheer. Um, I don't know what happened to her, but I can imagine. <laughs> Miss uh, Chandler, the ultimate seduction means what? I mean, how do you go about uh, seducing us in the uh, ultimate seduction? Well, in this case, it's work. Work. Yes, it comes from something Picasso told me. I went to see him in the south of France. And uh, he said, the passions in life change, but it is your work that is the ultimate seduction. And uh, for all of the people in this book, the very lucky people who got to do what they wanted to do, were able to do it very successfully. Work was the ultimate seduction. Nine people over there asked me, I've got to ask Charlotte Chandler, what was Mae West really like? Because Mae West comes out to pretty importantly in the ultimate seduction. Well, she was like Diamond Lil, but she would say she was Diamond Lil, but she was something more too. And she was really quite a character. When I first went to see her, I sat and talked with her, and there was this sound in the room. And I was looking around for little birds because I heard the fluttering of wings, and it turned out to be her eyelashes brushing her cheeks. <laughs> That's funny. And when I first met her, she held out her hand, and I scratched the palm of my hand on her uh, diamond rings, which were very sharp. And she looked at my hands, and she said, oh, you poor thing, I didn't have any diamonds. She always made an entrance mm -hmm. into a room, didn't she? And, uh, yes, she did. It was very great. An entrance she liked to and an exit. She straight back chairs yes. and things like that. She'd spent three hours getting ready for me. She said, if I'd been a man, it would have been six. Oh. And Jack, how can we not ask, uh, since you're my anchor man, right-hand man, left-hand man, <laughs> how can we not ask about the uh, well, doll? Well, the doll. That's wonderful yes. doll. Oh, this is Charlatina. Charlatina? Yes. yes. This is her television debut. Oh, lucky and her. Yes, I made Charlatina, but Charlatina is a caricature of me, and it's based on a drawing that Federico Fellini did of me in Rome. And uh, How do you get a Federico Fellini to do a drawing of you? 
Well, he was showing me Rome, and it was part of my book. It was oh, conversations with him. Thing. We spent several weeks there. It was, it was quite marvelous. And uh, we were there at the Grand Hotel, and he drew this picture of me. He drew me with the gold earrings, which I don't know. He must have been very wear. fond of you to do that. Uh, we had a very good time together. Uh, he didn't usually like giving an interview or seeing people, but um, he believed in the playful conversation, and that's what we were having. So he drew me with these gold earrings I never wear, and I asked him why, and he said I'd wear them inside. So I oh, hope so. Isn't that nice? Charlotte is very recognizable mm -hmm. around New York City and around New Jersey. When she walks, mm -hmm. everybody says, Charlotte Chandler, I saw you on, on TV. On the Joe Franklin show. <laughs> <laughs> on the Frank Joplin <laughs> show. But, uh, <laughs> Few of these they do it all the time. Charlotte is, a, is TV experience. She knows enough to bring along visuals. What's happening? Oh, well, that's, that's it. The, that's the picture of uh, Charlatina that Fellini did. All right. And, and here uh, we have. The next one's with Betty Davis. Is she in the ultimate seduction? She certainly is, yes. And these are all conversations. And these are all conversations with, with about 100 people of legendary achievement. Were they all as charming to you as Fellini was? Um, they were all different, but uh, they were all special. Tennessee Williams was a very exciting one, and that's Douglas Fairbanks, Jr., who um, Was there just, anybody that gave you a rough time? Um, actually, no. Um, maybe Picasso more than others. Um, one of the things that he did was he drew a picture of me, like Fellini did, but I didn't get the picture. Oh. And that's my punchline. He drew a nude of me, even did though he... I was sitting there fully dressed. It was a very exaggerated, very, very exaggerated nude. And no part of it looked like me, except the curls at the top. And the curls at the top of my head looked exactly like me. And he signed it P-I-C-A. Why would and, he give uh, it to you? Well, he said, would you like to have it? And he held it out very temptingly. And I reached for it, and he pulled it back. And he said, you want this picture? And I said, oh, yes. And he said, if you want it, take off your clothes. <laughs> oh, yeah. if, some, if he'd offered it to me, I wouldn't have done anything. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> is there a big difference in life, Charlotte, between these, these romantic heroes in, in, in real life and, and as they appear on the screen? Big, big difference? Actually, the major difference that I found is confidence. Confidence. Yes. On the screen, it's easy for heroes to have perfect confidence. And in real life, they don't have that perfect confidence. And in fact, if they did, it would be rather objectionable and arrogant and unpleasant. Well, on the screen, you know you, all your words are written for you, and you know how things are going to come out in the end, so you can have a great deal more confidence. When you, when, well, the fear of the unknown, I think, is what makes people a little Let tense. me uh, mm -hmm. add to my panel. I'm chatting here. We've got a fantastic show for you today. Charlotte Chandler has got another biggie called The Ultimate Seduction, published by Doubleday. Jack Wrangler writes about... Uh, his storybook romance. Will, will, it, will it be a happy ending forever after with, with Margaret? Margaret? We've been together seven years, mm -hmm. and um, I just left her before I came over here. And, uh, unless my bags are packed when I get back, I think I'm fine. You will live happily ever after. Yes, I hope Margaret so. Writing, and it tells about Andy Devine, Hermione Gingold, Jane Russell, Mamie Van Doren, Yvonne DiCarlo, and many, many more funny stories about uh, the young man who won the uh, Emmy for Faith of Our Children, the family that prays together, stays together. I want to bring in some people to join our panel. We're only just beginning to stay with us today for a show of shows. A big one. Lady Martin paint is a quality paint created especially for women. It's delicately scented, comes in white, and 16 delicious decorator colors, like pineapple and champagne. Covers in one coat, dries in just 30 minutes, and you only need water to clean up. But best of all, at Lady Martin's second gallon free sale, you get two gallons for the price of one. At Martin's, they know how to treat a lady. Roaches, public enemy number one. They come out at night and scurry all over your kitchen carrying germs and diseases. Roaches leave filthy droppings behind them. They crawl over food or even creep into your shoes. Yuck! But how do you get rid of them? You've tried smelly spray insecticides, but look, roaches can smell too. So they avoid the sprayed areas and keep coming back. Now there's a solution to roach problems. Roach Kill, the amazing odorless powder with a double your money back guarantee. In tests at a leading university, the powder in Roach Kill proved 99.5% effective with only one application. The powder was far superior to six other insecticides tested. Scientists agree that when properly applied, the Roach Kill formula kills and controls roaches better than any spray insecticide. 
Roach Kill is easy to use. Just squeeze the powder from the Roach Kill bottle behind appliances and in other hiding places. Roaches can't smell Roach Kill, so they don't flee to other parts of your house as they do with aerosol insecticides. They walk right through the Roach Kill powder, which clings to their legs, and carry it back to their hidden nests within the walls. There it kills not just the midnight crawlers, but the whole colony that breeds new roaches. Roach Kill is so incredibly effective that it has a double your money back guarantee. Using a bottle as directed, if Roach Kill doesn't kill every last roach in your house, simply return it after a two-week trial and we'll send you double your money back. Think of it, a product so amazing that it has a double your money back guarantee. It's not sold in stores, so pick up your phone and order now. Get extra bottles for garages and basements. Call toll-free 1-800-554-7000 for COD Visa or MasterCard orders. That's 1-800-554-7000 or mail 995 plus $2 shipping and handling. Remember, 1-800-554-7000. This offer may end at any time, so order before midnight tonight. 1-800-554-7000. 1-800-554-7000. When it's time to move, remember the name Roselli. Roselli Movers will get you into your new home with no hassle. Roselli crews are careful and fast, and they know how much your furniture means to you. Of course, they can't move you this fast, but when you're experienced, it sure seems like it. I'm Bill Roselli. My name is on every move, so it has to go smooth. Call Roselli Movers for a free quote on your next move. the uh, real estate expert in about a second. I've got to ask him, of course, the big question, the one I've always wanted to ask the real estate expert named Tony Hoffman. How do I get a seven-room apartment for about $100 a month <laughs> <laughs> on Park Avenue and 63rd Street? I'll, I'll meet uh, Tony with you officially in a moment. I want to say again, good morning. We hope you're enjoying the uh, political climate and the uh, presidential climate and the uh, uh, climate uh, of the pre-winter weather, as we say that we've got today... Uh, a good climate going with our panel. We're chatting here with Mr. Uh, and the excitement is uh, generating its mounting for Mr. Universe, Peter Nielsen, and Mr. Uh, Jack Wrangler, who writes the story about uh, romance and uh, growing up in show business, tells me he is a fan of a man named Alan Ebert. Yes, I am. But he goes to my gym, or he used to. I haven't seen him around lately. Um, well, of course, when we talk about going to a gym, we don't do it like Mr. Universe does it. We just no. sort of show up. Well, I'll tell you one thing. When <laughs> he's into the tanning room. When he's with us, say it again. Go into the tanning room at the gym. Yes, tanning exactly. Room. Right, in the when, sauna. When he comes with us today, we're going to feel secure. And we're chatting with Charlotte Chandler, who has written The Ultimate Seduction. But we never, I, I didn't find out. The uh, Groucho, you say, is, is, is prominently in here, I hope, somewhere, uh, Charlotte? I hope so. Oh, yes, he's very much there. In fact, uh, I was seeing some of the people who were in this book at the time I saw Groucho. Right. And uh, he said, you really should be writing a book about all of those famous people. And, so he inspired uh, you. I was seeing Chagall at the time that I saw him and took a picture that Groucho had drawn to show to Chagall. And Chagall said it was very much like his style. Charlotte and uh, Jack, in this industry known as uh, show business or in acting, there is a gentleman known as Richard Portnow. He is known as the completely perfect, excellent leading man. Mr. Portnow <laughs> has handled many, many incredibly uh, important assignments, all kind of big uh, shows and movies, and everybody is raving now about a play. But first, got to tell you, Richard Portnow, that I'm a fan, so we got to ask you, uh, what triggered your interest as a young man in acting, and was it uh, was it easy achieving this kind of recognition? And was there was there knocking on doors? And what was the first lucky break? And that's all of that was involved in it. Actually, what triggered my entrance into the theater was an accident. I was in college at the time, and I needed an A to keep my average up. And a friend of mine said, "Well, take acting. It's an easy course, and you meet a <laughs> lot of girls, and you don't have to take any difficult tests." And everything he said was true. And I <laughs> caught the bug and stayed with it. I have been around for a while, knocking on doors and walking around from casting out for the casting but is, out. Is there much uh, knocking on doors for people before that first lucky break? Or yeah, really? a lot of that is involved. Uh, I was fortunate in working with the Cafe La Mama during its heyday in the late 60s. And that led to my getting introduced to various agents that have helped promote my career. There is, a, uh, play, there is a play about to open with a very colorful and provocative title. It's called Bleacher Bums. You want to give Charlotte here, here. and uh, Bleacher Bums, that's not the old Ebbets Field where they would say Dem Bums. That, no. no. <laughs> that took place in Brooklyn. This takes place in Chicago. Chicago. It's about the Chicago Cubs 
who almost got the pennant this year, but they took a nosedive, unfortunately. And the play deals with this fanatical group of Cubs fans known as the Bleacher Bums. They, in fact, exist at Wrigley Field in Chicago. And uh, it's a very colorful play. I'm the gambler who fades their action. And uh, there's a surprise twist at the end. And it's written by a very important Broadway star. As a matter of fact, it is. It's written and conceived by Joe Mantegna, who won the Tony for the Best Supporting Actor in Glengarry Glen Ross. Um, Gee, that's great. Has he written uh, other, other plays as well? I believe this is the only one. He conceived the idea, and the play was written through improvisations with the Organic Theater Company in Chicago, which has lately become very, very popular and important in New York theater circles. All the Chicago actors are moving to New York and getting great reviews and doing wonderful work, and we're all very excited about this play. Well, it hasn't man, been done here since 78. The man who won the Tony Award has written it, and uh, it's red hot. They say it's going to uh, be a long run, and uh, except that sometimes uh, in off-Broadway plays, you're not allowed to run too long. Is that That's correct. This is a limited run. Right. We're giving 16 performances, That's and all. we hope to move it to a larger house for an extended run. I met the producer, Elizabeth Krauss, yes. and she is uh, a young lady to watch in the producing field. A feisty gal. Yeah, spunky, <laughs> independent. What's the name of the uh, theater? The theater is the 1010 Players. It's located at the Park Avenue Christian Church at 1010 Park Avenue. Opens any minute. It opens on Saturday, October 27th, and we're all sold out for the opening night, but there are lots of tickets available for the rest of the run. Sound good to you, Charlotte? Would you maybe give it a critique? Charlotte seems to have a good connection with the New York Times. Whenever you read the New York Times, especially a section called Metropolitan Diary, you're going to read a big article about Charlotte. Does that sound uh, good to you about the bleach? I like mom? baseball. It sounds good to me. Are you, base are you into yes. baseball yourself, Richard? Are you, are you a baseball fan or, ju or just a baseball actor? I'm a baseball actor in this case. <laughs> um, I played ball, but the sport that I participate most in is uh, weightlifting, bodybuilding, and boxing. I can't think of anything more down-to-earth or more solid or more earthy than real estate, and this man has become celebrated for his ability to sort of translate that information to the public. His name is Tony Hoffman. He's got a best-selling book by Simon & Schuster, which even he couldn't buy a copy today, <laughs> That's right, Tony? True. That's true. I tried on the way up here and tried four stores and it was sold out. <laughs> What's it called? How to negotiate successfully in real estate. This man has many, many students and followers and seminars. What, what's your earliest recollection? I'm going to give it over to my panel in a second. But what's your first recollection ever of ever e even hearing that word, real estate, how the whole thing began? I was very fortunate. My dad was in it, in New Jersey, well, as a matter of fact. That helps. It, it did, and we got started that way. And he died before I was 13, but he made a couple of comments to me, one which I've never forgotten, and that's everybody's the same up to here. It's that last inch that makes the difference. And, and that sort of led me into the field of negotiations. And, it was either law or whatever it was. You are now on WOR-TV, Secaucus, New Jersey, and places where you could buy houses cheap years ago, like Hoboken or Secaucus or Fort Lee. I guess those days are over, right? Those days are long gone out there, although you'd be surprised. The Wall Street Journal just yesterday challenged me that, that you could buy a house for no money down in one day in any given city. And they sent a reporter and a camera out with me, and in a matter of nine hours, we had... And they picked a student out of my class, by the way, with no money, no credit, and absolutely no job. And by, by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we had a signed contract. So it can still be done right here in the New York area. I mm -hmm. still see those uh, ads proclaiming you, you can buy government land for $3 an acre. You think we should uh, respond to those ads, Tony? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, there's a lot of things you can do. You can go to Michigan, and you can buy tax sales, and they guarantee you 50% return on your money. I mean, where else can you get money like this that? This is a mass appeal subject. I'm going to lean back and listen, because everybody wants to get involved. Let me, <laughs> let me start with... Uh, uh, Jack and then Charlotte and then Richard. Our subject is well, real estate. There's been and this so is many television shows recently about uh, the ultimate investment in real estate and, and all this big hype about you don't have to have any money, you don't have to have any credit. This is the man. You this is the man. Well, boy, I've been watching this stuff. <laughs> I don't know. Can you really do that? Jack, uh, let me tell you. People have been saying you can't do it, and they're right. They can't. You see, and that's the problem. You have to be able to open up your mind. I'll try. Okay, if you're willing to open up your mind and you're willing to try, then you can do it. Anyone can. The key is forgetting the, putting your mind in jail. We all think we have to have 20% down and we have to go qualify for a mortgage. And uh, if only 8% of the people in this country can qualify for a mortgage. I have bought property for 13 years and I have never in my life used a bank to get a mortgage on any investment property. You don't have to. And as I said, the Wall Street Journal sent a camera crew. Wall Street Journal reports and followed me around yesterday and we actually filmed, I took a dancer, an unemployed dancer, and by five o'clock she owned a duplex in Long Island that she bought for no money down. 
Would you try it with me? I'll dress and everything. <laughs> I'd love that. And you've done it before, right? Charlotte, what do you want to say? Yes, or maybe ask. I should have you try it with a writer. Uh, it could be done with anybody. and It's, mm -hmm. it's simple. You, it, it's a matter of knowing what you're doing. Just like acting takes practice, just like writing takes practice, you have to go to school. You need the education. The steps are out there. There's books, there's tapes, there's, uh, there's, there's seminars, and that's what all these seminars on television are all proclaiming that you can do it. It's not only me. There's about six or seven people that have now come into the New York market with television only for one reason. The FCC has loosened its guidelines, and so now the television shows are being allowed on the various awesome. stations. Tony, what is maybe, maybe one common mistake made by those who fail to profit from their real estate when they could have profited, but maybe one, one uh, overall mistake that... Uh... Uh, the biggest mistake that I have found is that people don't realize that when they're buying property, they can't do it like they did it in the 70s. It's not that you buy something and hope it's going to go up in value. You have to buy property today at wholesale, sub-wholesale prices. You have to learn to negotiate so that you can sell that property at retail and still make a profit. You can't count on inflation carrying it like it did in the 70s. Are we allowed to ask one personal question? Of course. Uh, have you done well uh, financially? Have I done well? Let's say seven years ago, I had $1,400, a six-year-old car, a wife and two kids. All right. Uh, <laughs> to say right now, well, I live in a $620,000 home in L.A. Wow. I have two Mercedes. My wife has anything she wants, and I'm worth well into the millions. Boy, he's going to buy us all the sandwich after the show, yeah. right? What um, happened to the kids? <laughs> I still got the two kids and the wife. <laughs> Let me get a feeling from Mr. Portno. How do you do it? Clue me in. <laughs> well, you do it. it. It's really quite simple. Again, as I said, all you have to do is know that you can and i think that's really the confidence just like in acting just like you said an actor gets on stage he has that confidence Jack. you know the ending of the story i know the ending of the story that i'm going to be able to buy a piece of property it may not be this one i may have to go through six or seven you have to find people who need to sell their property not people who want to sell the property mm -hmm. that's the real key and they're they're out there people have gotten transferred people have gotten divorced people have deaths in the family there's good reasons they maybe they have a larger family right now and they need a bigger house and they have to get rid of the old house yeah. you need to find someone who needs to sell their property not wanting to sell and then all of a sudden you start negotiating with but them. people are still hopeful that there might be some hot spots where today's bargain values uh, tony might represent uh, tomorrow's spiraling land values oh there are definitely hotter spots in the country than others but you can go anywhere within 20 minutes of your home and buy a property to tomorrow for no money down. Boy. These are, you, yes, Charlotte? I suppose you need to make your own timing in life, that you have to choose the time and that you want to do it, because if you're at the other end of it and you're the needy person who has to move or has to get something at that moment, then you have a greater problem. That's a, there, well, there's two factors to go with that. Mm -hmm. One is that, yes, you're right. You have to learn the pitfalls that go with the the, uh, the advantages of buying. You have to learn that there are things at the other end. You have to make, take precautions to make sure they don't happen to you. But second of all, you also have to realize that if you do have, supposing you get somebody in trouble, and a lot of people say, well, wait a second, by you buying a foreclosed property from somebody, you're stepping on someone who's already down. You know, you're taking away their property. That's not true. You're helping that yeah, person. Imagine. That person got himself in trouble. You're now saying, hey, I'll catch up your back payments. I'll make your credit good. I'll bail you out. You're not going to get what you want, but at least you're going to get something more than the bank taking the property back. And we're both going to be happy. These are busy, busy people, Mr. Tony Hoffman. Let me tell you, he's in the middle of a seminar at this moment, right? Right, right. Here got about are. 800 people you know, waiting waiting <laughs> breathlessly. So we're going to let them. Now, if anybody wants to reach Tony, is there a toll free number? Toll free number for when the seminar is going to be in your city. It's 1 800. 543 star make it real easy 1-800-543 star well my real estate star richard port now who is a fantastically brilliant gifted actor in a Thank show you. called bleacher bums one more time the address uh, and the theater 1010 park avenue it's at the park avenue christian church we open october 27th and run through november 18th and the number to call for reservations if i may please is 736-9099 and charlotte chandler in every book window from coast to coast right you can't miss the ultimate seduction fabulous lady and jack wrangler will you would you come back one day with margaret whiting i would love to and so would she fabulous lady this is a good book i recommend it we're going to carry on with exciting people following these words my friends we have for you today a show of shows and statements.